Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Welcome everybody to Nightlight. I have an amazing show for you today, and I'm so excited. I have John Matthews with um, with us again, and if you'll remember, we had he and his wife on with um, their Grail book a while back, which was fascinating. He is has no has been called and is known as the world's leading Arthurian authority, um, and he in his book that we're going to be talking about today reimagines one of the most beloved and influential legends, and that's the story of King Arthur and his knights for a new century. And the stories of King Arthur and Merlin, Lancelot, Guinevere, Galahad, Gwaine, Tristan, and the rest of the Knights of the Round Table um, have been with us forever. And, and the search for the Holy Grail, you know, it's been, these stories have been beloved for centuries and are the inspiration of many modern fantasy novels, films, and shows. These legends began with an obscure Celtic, I guess it's Celtic, hero named Arthur when he stepped onto the stage of history sometime in the 6th century, generating a host of oral tales that would be inscribed um, for some 900 900 years later by Thomas Mallory and his classic, The Death of Arthur. The great book of King Arthur, which is what we're talking about tonight, brings these legends into the modern age using accessible prose for contemporary contemporary listeners for the first time. In addition to the stories of the death of Arthur, John includes many tales of Arthur and his knights, either unknown to Mallory or written in other languages, such as the story of Avenable and uh, the girl that brought up was brought up as a boy who becomes a famous knight. Morin, whose adventures are as fantastic and exciting as any found in Mallory's work, and a retelling of the life of the round table favorite, Gwen, from his strange birth to his upbringing among the poor to his ascension into the highest position, Emperor of Rome. In addition, there are some of the earliest tales of Arthur deriving from the tradition of Celtic storytelling. The epic hero is represented in a powerful story as the adventures of the Eagle Boy, The Coming of Merlin, which is based on the early medieval text, a early medieval text, and tells a completely new version of the great enchanter's story. John published his first independent, he is an independent scholar. He lives in England, and, and he published his first book in 1980, and has since gone on to publish over a hundred titles on myths, folklore, and ancient traditions. And he's worked on uh, he worked in the fi- on the film 
in the film industry as a historical advisor and won a BAFTA for his work on the movie King Arthur in 2004. Um, he's made a lifetime story of, of, of this amazing legend. And it, it is fascinating. The book is, you, you, you must read the book because it, it really, I thought that, you know, with, with my history in English and stuff like that, that, that I, I was pretty well versed in King Arthur and the Round Table, only to find that I haven't even rich, reached the level of kindergarten. Um, this book is an amazing collection. And it tells stories that that I had seen hints of in other places and didn't realize they all came together. And not only that, it's a large book. It's fascinating to read. And he has a second edition coming out next year. And I, I would have thought that he had, you know, sort of bottomsed out, but apparently not. And I think that there's a there's a really important message here. Um, with with the stories of Arthur and Merlin and the Round Table, and it's very poignant and it's important that we sort of remember aspects of life that possibly we have forgotten that that these stories bring back to us and remind us of. No book at all, ever, or story or myth, survives this long without having an important message for society, and I think it's important we sort of dip into it and, and take a really good look at to why all of this remains so currently in our memory base, and we recognize it and are reminded of aspects of human the human condition that are important for us to reflect upon today. So welcome to the show, John. I'm so glad you're here. This is such a – this book was – this book was such a joy to read. Well, thank you, and thank you for such a lovely introduction. <laughs> nice to be back. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, I when I started in with this book, I thought, okay, I'm just going to be reminded of all the stories I already know. And that was so far from the truth, it was unbelievable, because I just... I I was not aware of the wealth of material there is out there, and the la- it was so labor intensive for you to gather all of these stories from so many different places. How long was this book in the writing? Well, in a way, I suppose most of my life, um, because I've spent most of most of the last forty five years, fifty years, nearly studying the subject, and in that time, I've read pretty much every story there is uh, that I could get hold of. <clears throat> Excuse uh-huh. me. And it, it, it kind of led up to this. Um, I've always admired Thomas Mallory and his wonderful book, Mort D'Arthur, which is the source for so many things today. I mean, movies like John Borman's Excalibur, novels like Mists of Avalon, all of these different versions um, of these stories often go back to Mallory first before they start looking at the more ancient and historical aspects. So for me, Mallory was always very important. And I thought, well, what about all the stories he didn't tell? So I created, um, I suppose you could call him an amanuensis, a kind of a a scribe who um, worships Sir Thomas or Master Thomas, as he calls him, Um, and wants to collect the stories together that his master missed. So that's how it came, that's how it started. And um, once it got going, of course, the sheer range and level of the material uh, surprised even me. Well, it it just, I think what, what, what kept coming up and hitting me in the face was that, that, you know, 900 years worth of of collection and and more and it's it's sort of like this type of material does not stay on the fringes of humanity for this long unless there there are messages in it that are relevant to today it isn't just that it's the retelling of a story over and over again there's got to be something more poignant in it that is crucial for us today to be paying attention to. And 
the the more I read, the more I I, I got the feeling that that a lot of it has to do with um, a spiritual essence that is in the nobility of the of the knights and things and 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 their their quests and and the way in which they treated one another and to me there's there's a there's an, a heavy duty spiritual message that applies to today much more than ever before well i agree um i think that um, one of the things that has kept these stories alive for so long is exactly that the fact that there is something that is more profound and different to the way most of us live our lives. Um, I think the examples that you have in these stories show a group of people who are really at basis ordinary men and women, but who are very uh, brave, and very concerned about the world around them, want to make the world a better place. Uh, and they're challenged again and again um, by all kinds of different things, by whether it be monsters or ghosts or demons or whatever you like. Um, and it, always they bring uh, their honor and their strength and their purpose to bear on it. And for that reason alone, I think that makes them very important. Uh, I mean, one of the things that, that I think has been said before, and I've certainly always uh, gone by this, is the fact that there is something for everyone in these stories. Whether you read the book, the ones in my book, whether you read the ones in Mallory, it's not just about a king and a round table and a bunch of knights. It's also about their courage, about the things they overcome, uh, about their efforts to be... Well, not perfect, but at least to do the best they can. And I think mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons why people keep on reading them and keep on enjoying them. I mean, they're great fun as well. Let's not be, let's not, let's not forget that these were written mostly for entertainment. Um, the the original writers of most of these stories were the troubadours and jongleurs uh, who travelled across Europe uh, in the Middle Ages, telling these stories. Um, we have several accounts from various contemporary sources that say again and again, when it got to that time of night when everyone had eaten and had a good bit to drink, someone would say, can we have a story? And the storyteller would get up and they'd say, he'd say or she would say, what, what kind of story? And in nine cases out of ten, they said, story about King Arthur, because they were mm -hmm. loved then as much as now. Well, and, and I, I think I think in reading through them, it just to me it was it was so amazing how there was a oh I I don't want to call it a cuteness, but but there was there was a sense of humor in in a great deal of this as well, and it it comes through in a lot of these stories about the temptations that the knights were put through and put up to and and the and in many cases where you know I made a promise and I kept it as best I could it wasn't that it was 100% but I did the best I could with it and you know they 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 give you messages for today it it's it's it, it blew me away when I finally clicked on to the fact that that there were messages for today and the stories I had to go back and start again because I had been skipping, you know, I, I had not recognized it as I was reading it. So in many ways, what you're doing with these stories is you are um, stirring into the consciousness of the people that read the books, a reminder of a, of a, of a characteristic that is in every human being, but not not always used, and especially today. I mean, the honor and the honesty and the integrity that that is portrayed in in a lot of these. You know, yeah, you know, I'll 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 come and rescue you, but I have to do this first, and I have this challenge first, and I have this promise first. It it is a nobility that. It would be wonderful if we had it today, but 
re- reminding us that it did once exist or that it is something that we can can certainly reach for within our own lives is important to remember and and I think that that's what these stories tell you and remind you that that there is a nobility within the the human spirit that that often is ignored oh absolutely i mean funnily enough i've just finished uh, one of the stories i'm doing for um for the new collection um which is one <laughs> is a dutch one called the romance of wellwine which of course is the dutch for gawain and yes it's uh-huh. another gawain there are so many um and in that one he has to make a choice between completing the task he's been set by Arthur um, to recover a magical chessboard or take this young lady that he's rescued uh, back to her family. And he decides to finish the job first. And she's not too pleased about it. But at the same time, he says, this is my, this is my task, this is my role, I must do this first. Um, so it's like ro- love, love, uh, not conquering this time, but honor and honesty and a sense of wanting to complete the task conquers in this case. And Gawain is very typical of the Knights of the Round Table in that in that approach to life. Oh yeah, and, and you know, I, I am finding that that you even have archetypes here that I had not realized at first. And and again, it's it's a matter of. Yeah, I can remember in high school we we went through um, King Arthur and and you know the basic story, and yeah. um, but but never did did I, did we go into any of these other segues into it and where they came from and and Merlin especially, um, which you know again is a part of the human condition that we never dip into. And and it it's it, it amazed me that that as I went kept going back and rereading, I kept finding new levels and new layers of it. These aren't just stories told around a campfire, so to speak. These are stories that have amazing information and reminders to the human spirit that that it's important. And what better stories to tell your children? Rather than you know Hansel and Gretel and all of those, well, well the grim stories, the grim fairy tales are really grim, but um, but these stories do t- do give you um, illustrations of nobility of spirit that that um, I think are important for children to know and learn, and it's a shame that we can't integrate these more into our children's. Um, psyche when they're very very young. I mean, you know, I'm I'm 78 years old, 79. Sorry, 79. And and I'm now seeing the relevance in these stories that I did not see 30, 40, 50 years ago. Mm. So, well, yes, you know, imp- sorry, it's 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 certainly there. I mean, um, I'm not sure. I mean, a lot of the stories are not for children. I will have to say, because no. they are quite strong stuff. Um, but certainly by, by teenage years, they'd be able to get most of them. And some would, would get would get the good stuff, if you like, out of these before uh, before they, before any anything more adult, shall we say, came into mind. But uh-huh. um, I think it, it's this universal quality that you're picking up on. I mean, I, I set this, I gave this a setting. Uh, very specifically, and this is part of my own work in um, writing and developing the Arthurian stories for, for telling. Uh, I set it within an ancient forest. It's called the Great Wood throughout the book. Uh, its actual mm-hmm. name is Brosilli, and it's a, a forest that actually exists in Brittany. Um, but what I've done is to extend that forest over the whole of the land of Britain, or Logris, as it's called in the Arthurian stories. Um, and with and that forest is incredibly ancient, and Merlin comes from within that forest, and the fairy beings who play such a large part in these romances also come from that forest. So the forest, if you like, is a metaphor in a way for the other world, um, and it's uh-huh. like we're moving 
space, a different time, a different sense of reality um, to the reality of the Middle Ages, which, you know, as you know, was not a great place to be at times. It was cruel. It was harsh. There was a lot of warfare. Um, it reminds one rather of today in some respects. Um, but um, it's, you know, it was in response to that that these stories were told and then written. People wanted a better world. They wanted to believe in something that lifted them out of the everyday cares and troubles of the world and gave them something to focus on and something to reach towards. And I think that is the heart. And the heart and soul of these stories is, is in, it's in all of them. Yeah, just if, if you had to um, put a time frame as to when this actually is set, where in time would you put it? Because I know I have, when I was doing my um, ancestry work, um, I found that <clears throat> one branch of the family did come from Great Britain, and there were kings in in that particular line, but, but they were kings um, who had a territory and lived in a mud hut. I mean, you know, <laughs> they didn't even call it king, but, you know, not you know to me a king is somebody who has a palace and all of that stuff and and these kings you know they they better were probably labeled chieftain but they were called king whoever and and it it was kind of like isn't that cool i have nobility and then it, then i took a look at the time frame and what was going on in great britain at that particular time point and, it, 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 and to me it was like well King is not that big a deal at this particular moment in time. So if you if you were going to set this in a time frame, where would you have set it? I mean, Mallory went back 900 years to to pick well, up, you know, the well, the, the more was was published in 1485. Um, okay. After after Mallory himself had died a few years earlier was published by William Caxton, who had one of the first printing presses in London. Um, but the thing here is that there are there's really more than one Arthur. There's probably several, actually. But I've been, uh, on the historical side of things, um, I discovered or, or, or have written about, I didn't discover it, it was discovered in the 1920s, um, about a character called Lucius Artorius Castus. Uh, Artorius being the Latin for Arthur, who was a second okay. century Roman officer who came to Britain with the Roman legions and whose story, which I, I've managed to piece together with um, uh, my, my colleague Linda Malcor, um, was also the foundation of the movie King Arthur, uh, on which I served as a historical advisor. And that part of the story puts Arthur in the second century A.D., very early. Then you have another uh -huh. gap, and the fifth, end of the fifth, beginning of the sixth centuries, which is when you had the chieftains who were still called kings, as you said, um, and and one of those was Arthur, was called Arthur, um, and he came to fame particularly because the Romans left Britain, and when they left, the Saxons who were coming across from the Germanic countries invaded. But Arthur brought together all these different tribes people and the different groups and had them fight together to defend the land. And it was that, uh, those actions that made him, if you like, I suppose you could say uh, uh, the ultimate hero, if you like, in, in, our, in our history, in the history of Great Britain. Um, then there's a long gap. There's a long gap from the 6th century until the 11th. And at the 11th century was when you started getting stories told. I mean, stories have been told all the time by wandering storytellers, but they started to get written down, particularly in the 11th century, starting with Geoffrey of Monmouth, who told the story of Merlin, uh, and then various other writers, and most of them anonymous. We don't even know their names. Um, added to these, and they became incredibly popular. So, I mean... Most of the stories that I've retold 
were written down between the uh, the very late 11th century and the 14th when Murray wrote his book. So um, there's a long period of time there. So in a way, I tried to, when I was in my retellings, um, I tried to, to give it a medieval flavor, but not to say anything very specific that dated it to one period or another. So it's medieval. <coughs> Excuse me. But, okay. Um, it's um, it's not a period in time exactly, if you see what I mean. Yeah, it's it's he is he is eternal. I mean, it's it's just uh, the lessons that he's teaching and and the intricacies of some of these stories are just are, are just delightful. And um, I get, I kept thinking, I wish that I had 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 these stories to tell my son when he was growing up because I think that, that they, they lay the foundation for a, um, a nobility of spirit, if you will, that, that you know, uh, no matter what's going on in life, that, that if you have that integrity within yourself, then, then life has a greater meaning for you and, and for those around you. And and so um, you know, and of course, because of my background and whatever, I'm fascinated with Merlin. And and you know, he he comes across in in so many different ways, a timeless energy, sort of as as no matter what time frame, Merlin does seem to appear and be able to um, sway the story in a new direction. And um, even down to the conception of Arthur, so that so that you know his his talents and his skills impact history tremendously, and yet he fades he fades from view, and then he comes back again, and then he fades from view, and he comes back, and 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 it's almost as though people in some ways are waiting for him to come back yet again because the times are so crucial and so crazy that a little bit of magic would help a lot. So, you know, it, 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 <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I mean, but go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say Merlin. No, Merlin I, is a, a charismatic character, isn't he? I mean, he oh comes and gosh, goes. Yeah. Story, and uh, he has, you know, although you get different versions of his coming, you know, of him being born of a demon. And then, you know, baptized so that he becomes a good man. Um, but mm-hmm. he's ageless and he's he's much more complex than that. Uh, I've always been fascinated oh, yeah. by him. And, you, you know, know he, and he's... He, he, I, I totally agree. I, I would love to see a whole book, uh, book just on Merlin because um, there's so much here that, that he does that that speaks of, and of course the, the spirituality is, is ingrained in all of it. And, and he usually, he, he, he doesn't seem to have used his power inappropriately. No, that's but, right. But even though, you know, his birth is, is a little bit questionable, but, but, you know, it's, <clears throat> it's a matter of, it's a matter of, where you choose, how you choose to apply the power you're given, and I think that's yes. that's a, an amazing lesson for for everyone. That that you know those who have power, you know they can use it, they can use it any way they want, and yet it does determine the kind of person they become. Oh, absolutely. I so, mean, he has a vision. You know, Merlin has a vision right from the start. The vision of the coming of Arthur. Uh, of a great king, a great kingdom, of course, the round table, which in some stories he has, he, he himself creates, Camelot the Golden, the city that is mm-hmm. Arthur's home, and the home to the knights of the round table. All of these things seem to come out of Merlin's imagination and then, then born and become real uh, in the stories. Um, and, you know, this is, this is, his function is that, to take it as far as possible. And then it has to be said that he gets so tired of 
the negativity within humanity that he decides to withdraw. You know, he stays for as long as he can, and then he says, I've had enough of this. I'm going to go <laughs> into my, my little house with, with, the, with the 72 windows built for me by my sister, and I'm going to watch what happens in the world, but I'm not going to take part anymore. And, and there are no stories of him returning. What is interesting, however, yes. is that from about the uh, 14th century onwards, right through, I suppose you'd call it the, a period of the Enlightenment when, you know, new kinds of philosophy and ideas and beliefs were coming in uh, throughout the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, there continued to be produced a series of books called The Prophecies of Merlin. And it's up to you whether you think that's even that's a possibility or indeed whether he was right or he had that kind of power. The point what point is that people believed it and they kept publishing more and more prophecies, often of which it has to be said were written down after the event. But then they would yeah. say, but Merlin said this is going to happen. And it did. Um, so that there's, there's a belief in him that transcends just the story. Um, and becomes something much more than that. He becomes a figure of, um, of nobility and of strength and of wisdom um, that he passes on to everyone. Well, I think one of the other things that that occurs in these stories, which, it, you know, it, it, you still, even though I know, I, I understand that, that you know, it, it's legends, but there are also aspects of actual events and actual things that bring you to question, is it really a story or is it not? I mean, let's let's look at Excalibur. Um, he gets it from the Lady of the Lake and that when he dies, he asks them to, to throw his sword into uh, the lake and they have since found a lot of swords um, thrown into lakes and stuff like that when you know at, at the end of a battle and stuff like that. So, so that that you have the physical proof that this was a tradition, and you wonder if the tradition came from the story or if the story came from the tradition. Well, for me, I would say the story comes from the tradition. I mean, it's interesting you mentioned that particular story of the sword, because in my research into the character I mentioned earlier, Lucius Artorius Castus, who was a real person who really did live, um, uh-huh. the, only, the only other place that I know in all the mythologies of the world that has the same story um, is comes out of the Sarmatian people who are from um, the Urals and that, that area um, around the Red Sea and the Black Sea. And they alone have this story of a hero who's called Batraz, who at the end of his life asks his lieutenant to throw his sword into the lake. And he tries three times and finally he does it the third time. This is exactly what we have in the Arthur story. So isn't it interesting that you've got an even older tradition from another country influencing the mythology of uh, of Britain? I think that's really amazing. Well, and and the the searching for the Holy Grail. I mean. Oh, absolutely. I mean that that again. Um, is there really a Holy Grail, or is there not? I mean, it, it you know, even that is up for up for grabs these days. I mean, and what was the Holy Grail? Was it um, the bloodline? Was it a chalice? Was it a bowl? Well, you know, so that, so that there's enough in the stories that you can, you can trace back to actual history to a certain degree that, that makes you, you know, it teeters you on that edge you know, is it a story? Is it real? Are these a number of different people? You know, and and isn't there an abbey someplace in in Britain that that swears that they have the grave marker for for not only Arthur but Guinevere as well? 
yes, that's Glastonbury, Glastonbury Abbey. Um, unfortunately, uh, the historical consensus these days is that that was made up by the monks of Glastonbury Abbey because they, the, uh, the original abbey had burned down. And so they suddenly uh-huh. said, oh, look, we've been and we found these giant bones. And they, there's, a, there's a, a cross attached to it, and it says, here lies Arthur in the island of Avalon, which is the other name for Glastonbury. Um, and uh-huh. they very conveniently then got a big bonus from the king to rebuild the abbey. Uh, and it became a <laughs> pilgrimage. So, you know, there's, there, there's always that side of it in a way. But, I mean, once you get into the grail, of course, that is where everything comes together. Because um, it's like all of the adventures of the Knights of the Round Table lead up to that. Every single version of the story says the same thing. This was what the Round Table was created for, really. Merlin had foreseen it. And it, it's like everything else has been preparing the way. And then they all go on quest. And only three of them are successful out of the whole bunch. Because it's a test of their human nature. And again and again, many of them fail. But they keep trying. That's the point. They don't give up. Um, but the three who do succeed, who are, I suppose you would say, um, especially equipped to find this, you know, they have a great um, uh, sacredness about them. Um, it, it, that, that leads to the heart of the story. But, you know, of those three people, it's a very interesting fact. The one who is considered to be the most sacred and the most holy and who looks into the grail is Sir Galahad. And Sir Galahad uh-huh. is the son of King Arthur. Uh, sorry, sorry. The son of Lancelot. The second most successful knight is Sir Percival. And Sir Percival is, I guess, the, the medieval word for it is a simpleton, an innocent, someone who doesn't really understand the world at all. And he kind of blunders through life into the secret of the grail. And the third successful person is Sir Bors, and Sir Bors is the ordinary man. He's the man in the street. He's the he's the, the guy who doesn't really know exactly what he's here for, but he's got this feeling that he wants to achieve something wonderful. And so in those three people, you have every aspect of humanity. And I think that's what makes the story so relevant to us still because it shows that anyone uh, anyone can achieve what they set out to achieve if they understand it, if they are able to try and if they don't in the end succeed they have at least tried mm-hmm. and that counts too I mean it's not, it's not a matter of failure, it's a matter of trying and, and I think that's, that's an important an important part, you know. It's, it, you know, I, I put the effort forth. I didn't fail. I just didn't get as far as I would have liked to have. Well, I think that that's so, true of many of us. You know, I mean, uh, we're none of us perfect. We do our best. We do our best to live well, uh-huh. honestly and honorably. Um, and that, of course, is where you get again the examples of these extraordinary characters from the stories that. You know, that where they do that, you see them doing it. You see them trying and sometimes failing, often succeeding, uh, being, you know, honest and honorable and, uh, you know, not, not killing their adversaries if they can. Um, so, you know, really reflecting a kind of mirror image almost of what the medieval world was really like, because, of course, it was a much more brutal place. And uh, the idea of chivalry... Um, which is represented by Mallory's writing and in a lot of these other stories that I've retold, is an idealized form of chivalry. Uh, because mm-hmm. these are ideal stories. You know, they are, they're not expected to be realistic, but they bring with them uh, an energy and a belief system, I think, that um, many of us recognize. Well, and, you know, that was we we spoke to earlier about the the one thing that 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 got to me was was you know was this kind of chivalry actually there? I mean, if somebody lost a joust or whatever, did they really have to turn themselves over to the other guy's king or whatever? Um, and and 
somehow you you just don't see um, people losing a battle and then picking themselves up and going to the the ruler of whatever country um, you know the other guy was a part of and, and turning himself in so to speak. It just it it you know that that's extreme. Um, and in in the stories, it, it was it was almost they were honor bound to do it. it. This was a part of being a knight. Well, this again is what I meant by the the idealistic side of it, because in in reality, of course, that didn't happen. Um, at least not very often. What was more likely to happen was that a knight who was captured in a battle um, would would be you know uh, incarcerated, but then he'd be released on payment. Um, of a ransom by his family or by mm-hmm. his king or his mm-hmm. leaders. So, you know, the reality is still a long way from the ideal. But that, again, is what the stories are doing. They're transcending the real world and saying, look, there's another alternative here. You know, so the, oh, yeah. so the concept of I... is is huge and very important. And I don't know... There are not certainly not very many characters in history who lived it in the same way as the Arthurian knights did. I mean, I think uh, William Marshall, who was a very famous 12th century knight, did his best to do so and perhaps succeeded to some extent. Um, but, you know, on, by and large, these are, uh, these are magical stories that give you an alternative reality that is reachable in some way. Um, and so the knights themselves um, know this. They know that there is some extraordinary, uh, you know, idea and ideal um, that they can live up to, and they do their very best to live up to it. And that, I think, is as much as you can ask for anybody. Well, I, I think, it, it, oh, absolutely. And I think at one point, um, I, I, I forget who it was, that that you know he became knighted and the first thing he wanted to do was to go out and challenge other knights and fight other knights not to kill them but to beat them mm. in battle and and yeah. so that it was a it, it 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 was kind of like you know I can't wait to to you know throw down everything and and go to battle with it, it was almost like you meet a knight you you go to battle um yes and, that's and, that's in almost was, every story you know, almost every story, the knights go what's called errantry. You know, they go on errantry, and that means they ride off looking for adventure mm-hmm. uh, and finding it, because we're in the magical world, and so around every corner in the great forest is another knight wanting to challenge you, or another lady wanting to be rescued, or a, or a princess who needs uh, something from you, or, uh, or or a fairy who wants to enchant you. I mean, they're, they're all there, and, and by the way, let me say at this point that a lot of people have said to me over the years that all this is about men. Well, it's not. I mean, I went out of my way to put in the story of a venable that you mentioned right at the beginning, uh, which is the story mm-hmm. of a, a girl who literally becomes a knight. And everyone thinks she's a man because women couldn't become knights at that time. But she behaves as one and she lives in the same way that they do and by the same ideals. And the other, the other thing that is so important about this um, is that in almost every single adventure that I found and that I've told in this, it is usually a woman who comes into the court not only to ask for help, but also to challenge the knights. Again and again, they'll uh-huh. come in and they'll say, so uh-huh. this is the great knights of the round table. This is Camelot the Golden. Let me challenge you to do this, to win this, to find this, to help this person. So, you know, far from being a world <clears throat> entirely dominated by men, uh, in many cases, the stories always begin with a lady. Well, and there was the one story where the the uh, the father of the princess um, you know, if people wanted to come and, and win her hand, they had to do battle with a number. They had challenges, and then the last challenge was to defeat her father in battle. And, yeah. um, you know, it, it it was sort of like, actually, I think she, somebody did finally kill her father. 
and it was like, you yeah. know, okay, you can marry me now. And, and I don't think the knight wanted well, to marry her. <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, exactly, then, this is another. This is a further instance of the way that the, the you know the medieval mindset worked. You know, I mean, um, women did not have uh, the, the the same um, recognition uh, as equals as they, as they do today, but they were honoured. You know, I mean, the whole idea of courtly love, which dominated most of the 12th century, um, was that the woman was a being that you put on a pedestal and worshipped from afar. And I'm not sure that that's mm-hmm. ideal either. But uh, it shows that, that, that respect existed. Um, there are very, very few stories um, where the women are badly treated. Sometimes they are stolen away. Sometimes they are hurt. But more often than not, they're usually captured because the knight in question or the lord in question actually wants to promote some action and he wants someone to come mm-hmm. and rescue her, uh, which, of course, leads to yet another tournament or another battle between one knight and another. So in that case, too, you know, the still the centerpiece of it is still, uh, is still the woman. Well, and the other thing is, too... Um, it's it's a battle between usually two knights. The element of war, where yeah, armies absolutely. are, you know, is is not so much there as as it is the individual confrontation of the two archetypes, if you will, and yeah. and and they don't have to kill each other either. I mean, wouldn't that be wonderful if if our problems with other countries and other people were were resolved and and i mean really resolved by a simple confrontation between two people and then you know whoever wins they win and you don't you know everybody accepts it and you you go on your way i mean yeah. it it it's I, I mean in some of the stories of arthur especially especially the ones that have been made into movies they do have wars but you don't see and hear that quite so much. Every now and then somebody musters an army, but for for the most part, it's it's usually individual confrontation rather than brute strength winning out. It's it's independent. You know, it, it's one archetype against another archetype as opposed to um, bloody battles where so many people are killed. Yes, indeed. But isn't it, I mean, wait a minute, which, and I can't remember which story because there were so many. Um, yeah. Wasn't there one where, where um, it, it was, it was a battle and, and, um, oh gosh, I can't remember where, where, where they had to choose who was going to be on what side and, and, um, I, I can't remember the whole story, but I, it, 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 it was a battle that I remember. So um, it, it, it's kind of like that when, when they were you know, solving issues or resolving problems, it was individual combat. It was not let's, let's get brute strength and kill everybody. It's let's have a contest and the winner will take all. Sure. Well, certainly, um, you know, there are there are actual historical stories of, you know, great heroes like the, the Seed, for instance, in Spanish tradition, who becomes a champion and will stand as the champion for the whole army, for the whole country. And so individual mm-hmm. champions would um, thus preventing war. And that, would have, that was agreed and that did really happen, but quite rarely. Um, but again, I think that that the way that those things are handled in in these uh, Arthurian tales is is much more what you're talking about, where people actually do have they, they play by the rules that are very different from the rules of real warfare today. For instance, uh, it's not just about the strongest; it's about the most noble, the most honourable. Strength and honour is a wonderful phrase that comes a lot into these stories. Strength and honour. Um, because uh, what do you do with it when you have it, when you have strength? Do you use it honorably? Um, you know, it's like T.H. White 
wrote a, a very famous uh, quartet of books called The Once and Future King, which later became the musical Camelot. And in that, Arthur has, he has a discussion with Merlin about the way that the whole country is falling apart. There's war and fighting everywhere. And he said, it's not a question um, of, of might against right. It's might for right. In other words, if you're going to use your strength, use it for a good purpose. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that is reflected in all of these stories. And and yet, when when Arthur dies, um, it is in a battle. Yes, and that um, of course is the dark, the darkness at the end of the tales. You know, um, it is a very human and very painful story in the end because it all begins to fall apart uh, after the Grail's after the Grail quest. It seems as though they can't go any further. They've reached the height, and now the only way is down. And then, of course, you have Arthur's son, Mordred, coming in, who challenges him. Um, and eventually they end up in being on opposite sides and, and having a great battle. And Arthur is wounded. But that's where it gets interesting, of course, um, because, as I'm sure you know very well, um, he, isn't, he, he doesn't die in the story. Um, but three, three queens come and load him onto a barge and take him away. To Avalon uh -huh. to be healed and to come again when he's needed and when I was working on this first the first collection of the, the great book of King Arthur um, I found a story that I had not come across before and it absolutely stopped me in my tracks I don't want to spoil it for those who are reading the book but I will tell you that part of it entails the hero of that story meeting Arthur in Avalon long after the time of the great adventures. And there is Arthur sitting in a hall with a sword Excalibur across his knees on a throne looking sad. And the hero says, why are you so sad, my lord? And Arthur says, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Do people remember me? And of course, ah. he says, absolutely, I remember you. And I just thought that was such an extraordinary story. It's like no other one. And it's the last story in the book, Arthur and Avalon. Um, and it's the only story I know that actually follows through from that wonderful mythical ending of him going off into the sunset, quite literally. Um, wonderful imagery that, that in, in John Borman's film Excalibur, if you remember that one, where they literally do sail off into the sunset. And... Um, you don't know what's going to come next. You don't know if Arthur dies or not, because there was a tradition and that it was very much believed in this country that he would come again. People still believe it. When um, when Sir Winston Churchill, you know, the, the great our, our last great leader at the end of the Second World War, when uh -huh. he died, uh, there was a huge procession through the streets of London with the coffin. Hundreds of thousands of people came out. And I know um, an elderly gentleman in the, those, the, in the watching crowd was heard to say, he's not really dead, you know. He's just sleeping, and he'll come back when we need him. So yeah. that same idea is still here. It was still current, even in 1949. So, I mean, it's, it's quite astonishing, really. Well, biblically speaking, um, it's the same with, with Jesus. You know, he will come again. So I, I think that that it's it's a hope that's instilled within the hearts of everyone that 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 in the time of greatest need there will be a return of spirit, a return of nobility, a return of honor, and and whether or not it's in a person or if it's a concept within the hearts of everyone, but but you know, that there will always be a person or a concept that will rescue us from destroying ourselves, hopefully. Um, it, it's, you know, your book, it was just such an amazing experience to read. And the fact that I had to keep going back and rereading stuff <laughs> because I had missed something. And, and I think that's where we are as a society today. 
we've missed something and we need to really remind ourselves of why we're here and who we are and what what it is we are here to accomplish not that anybody really knows totally but but it feels as though purpose has been lost and and again your book reminds us of the nobility of spirit um, I, I, I certainly I loved the the Grail book that you wrote. It was just so inspiring, and this this book especially is inspiring because it it reminds you of qualities that we all have within us that we aren't using right now, and and it's it's a shame because it would change society tremendously. But well, but it's a reminder here. And 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 you know the fact that your book is here. It's I mean, like I said, I I I was introduced to King Arthur and the, and the Search for the Grail in high school. It was one of the books that we read. And um, and, and after that, of course, I read a whole bunch more. But but your book is such a collection of the reminder of what it is that why we're here and. To, to to understand that you know you're going back a thousand a thousand years or more um, with these stories that have traveled through time and they've come through time and you're putting them forward. I mean, it's story after story after story after story, and they're fabulous stories. Um, well, so is the second and, uh, volume is this, is the second volume going to be as big as the first? Uh, it's, well, there's another thirty stories <clears throat> in it. Um, Three three sections again, more Grail stuff. Um, the uh-huh. Book of the Knights, Adventures, the Tales of Love and Honor, and Guardians of the Grail. They're the three sections within the book, and it's illustrated again by the wonderful John Howe, who most people will know of as one of the key illustrators of the Tolkien books and also the films. Um, once again, he's uh, he's producing some absolutely stunning imagery that, that so well match the stories. Uh, so there's another 30 on the way, and um, we'll see how we go at that point. I think that's probably enough. Um, but <laughs> um, certainly, certainly it'll, keep, it'll keep people reading, I hope. I like, the, I like to think oh. that maybe they'll still be reading my versions as long as they've been reading Mallory, but who knows? <laughs> well, I, I, I wouldn't doubt that at all. And you've also got The Fool's New Journey to Row. Is that actually a deck of cards, or is that a book? Uh, it is actually a, a, a tarot deck. It's not out until next year, um, but it's uh-huh. a kind of reading of the tarot. Um, so it's it's one that's still, you know, people are still not sure. I'm not sure, in, in fact, what to make of it myself, but it's a vision. And um, it does talk about the way that we are all fools in a certain way, um, or, and often behave foolishly, and what better is an image of that as someone trying to find their way through the mysteries of life uh, from that point of view. So that's kind of oh, what yeah. that's about. <laughs> that sounds exciting. Um, being it's someone me, in this so. used car. Yeah, no, that's very exciting. And uh, I recently put a deck out as well that was not... Tarot, is, tarot just means cards. So it's it's sort of like a different new kind, and you certainly have all of your archetypes in in these stories. I just I can't get over how many stories there are, how intriguing they are, how relative they are. If you look beneath, you know, their setting and superimpose it upon the setting of the times, how how applicable they are to remind us of the nobility of spirit we carry within and and if we lived by it if we made it a way of life um the world would be a better place oh yes most definitely most definitely i mean that's uh very baby baby steps once you know one person at a time (laughs) one way at a time and 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 i think that that's the important thing you don't have to make a sweeping gesture and make the whole world but person by person if you adapt yourself to this kind of a philosophy you know not to be taken advantage of by other people but to make sure that that 
that your the way you treat others, the way you live your life, has a has a better purpose to it than than others. Um, it changes everything. It changes society. It changes life. It. Um, I think that there is a real purpose and meaning behind these stories that that they have survived this long to reawakening to reawaken society to to what our purpose is and what our direction is. I mean, these stories didn't survive for over a thousand years for nothing. There's a reason oh, they you. have lived and 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 come forward again. And certainly you've done such a beautiful, beautiful job of putting them together. It's just it's magnificent. It really is. And, and it's a it's a treat to read them and you know, I think it would be fun to read them as a family and go back and talk about them. You know, about what did this mean? What was this purpose? There is an audio book of them, by the way, available. Um, so you can actually listen to somebody reading them. Although it would also be nice oh. to have maybe some family read them. But, you know, if you're all going to sit around and listen, why not? You know, who, do, who doesn't love being told a story? Absolutely, and you know it's 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 a lesson. It's not just a story. It's a lesson, and and if you can imprint this philosophy into a child, then you've you've changed that child's life and direction forever. Absolutely. I mean, and what bet you know what better to I mean, okay, so you know can, you can pretend to be King Arthur riding a white horse and holding Excalibur, but the behavior and the mannerisms and the the justice that is impar- imparted by this whole thing is just so precious. It's unbelievable. And, and you know, another, well, of course, I, I, I love Dr. Seuss. He has lots of lessons, too. But But these stories have come forward in time for a reason. They have survived this long for a reason. And, and it's just such a great gift that you've put them out there. Um, it would be fun if it could be broken up so that they would be individual stories that could be like a whole library you could give so that so that parents could say, well, let's read about you know Sir Gawain tonight, or let's read about let's read about these different nights and the things that they did, and 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 give a richness to a child's life that they don't have without you know with cartoons and what's going on on television. Sure, sure, I agree. If I, I believe the, the if, thought, if I believe the publisher has think is thinking about something like this. Well, you know, know, because you know, as a, as a teacher and a parent, if my if my child were were I know four, five, six years old now, you know, long enough to sit and listen to a story, um, I would I would have story hour every night. I would say, you know, who are we going to talk about tonight? Who are we going to read about tonight? Because if you give them these philosophies and these stories as a young child growing up, they have a richness that, that you, you just can't buy. Absolutely. Absolutely so. Yeah. So, well, oh, my gosh, I guess we're over time. I'm so sorry. Um, we could go on forever. But but once the new no book worry. is out, we will, def- we will definitely um, hit the new book as well. Um, but but the, the book is phenomenal. I highly recommend it, and and everybody should should pay attention to what they're reading. It isn't just a story; it's a lesson. And you know, when you when you approach it from that point of view, you learn so much from from these these stories that you have shared with us. That you know, they're not just stories; they're they're a whole lesson in life, and and it's important people understand that and can go back and gather what it is they're teaching us because it's an amazing way of, of becoming a more noble person. And and you can do that at any age because if at 79 I found it, then people much younger will find it too. I so I, I, did, I, I so thank you for spending your time with me and, and letting us bounce you around like we have. And um, I will definitely look forward to the second second book and 
we'll maybe I can talk you into doing a longer interview next time. Sure, absolutely. I'd love to. But and thank you very much for having me on the show and for being so kind about the book. The next one at the moment is called The Realm of Arthur and that will be out sometime next year. I look forward to it. I will watch for it and I will make sure you I get you on the phone as soon as I see it. So okay. <laughs> thank you. And and you know, it, it it's it's very appropriate. It's just you know, email me and say the book is out. Let's do something because I will jump at it. Bye. Absolutely. So I do. Make sure you get told. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks so much, John. This has been such a pleasure. I look forward to talking to you again. It's been lovely. Very much enjoyed talk. Okay. Uh, definitely. Good night now. Good night. Okay, everybody. Check us out. We're we're still on a roll here. Um, we have some surprises coming up, so uh, do keep us uh, tuned in and tuned on because there's a lot of really cool stuff going to be happening this month here and there. So um, pay attention because we've got new stuff coming, and it isn't just new books. It's, it's other stuff as well. So for now, I'll say good night, and I will I will definitely be. Um, Back on the air next week, and a cool book next week, too. So good night, everybody.